top mistakes developers make in their publisher relationships. So uh, as Suzanne pointed out, uh, maybe this one should have gone before the other one in, in hindsight, but, uh, but I think some of the things we're going to talk about uh, certainly uh, dovetail uh, into or from uh, what Adam and I were just talking about. So uh, again, this is assuming uh, publishers and developers are choosing to work together or, or, or publisher is right for you as an independent studio. Uh, mistakes often happen, right? The, the independent development studios, uh, as, as we mentioned in the last panel, um, aren't always the strongest business entities. So, uh, for a variety of reasons. So, so mistakes are made, and uh, uh, a few of them are solvable, and a few of them certainly could uh, uh, could be avoided. So that's what we want to talk about here. And again, uh, like the last one, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to, to ask them. You don't have to wait till the end. Before we talk about what the mistakes are that the independent studios make, I think it's important to talk about why they're, why the mistakes are made in the first place. And, and uh, so we've got a couple of things that sort of tend to be uh, in common. And, and I've worked with five or 600 independent development studios uh, over the last 20 years or so. And you, know, it, you start to see some of the same things occurring. Uh, the, fir the first mistake is made out of desperation. Publishers, I'm sorry, developers often just need the money, right? And they'll do anything. Um, they want the deal for credibility's sake, uh, or, or they, they don't necessarily look at the business side of things. They just look at, you know, I really want to be working with EA, or I really want to work on the Call of Duty franchise, and I'll do anything. Uh, and sometimes they don't have any options. So, uh, so that's sort of the, the first reason that developers make mistakes in, in general. Uh, Susanna, Susanna is going to talk about the, the next one, uh, but but it's another reason. That it's the, literally the opposite, where they just um, they think that they have it all set up and their game is the best game ever, and um, they're sure that it's going to work out perfectly. Nothing bad's going to happen. They think that everything's going to go well. They're going to hire the perfect artist, the perfect programmer. Things are going to go well. This is where you really need to almost parent your clients who this is their first endeavor, and even prior when they're desperate for a deal. You need to sit them down and be like, okay, but why are, do you want this deal? Why do these terms appeal to you even though they're so objectively terrible? Um, so knowing what kind of mistakes and expectations your client or you are going into the deal with can really help you tailor the deal better to your actual needs and not whatever optimism or um, desperation you're coming in with. Yeah, I, I've had developer clients say to me, no, this is... This is going to be the perfect marriage. This this relationship, this publisher gets it. Our, our budget, there there won't be any problems on the budget. There won't be any overruns. And I and I told every one of them that said that. I said, well, that will be the first deal like that I've ever seen. Related so. to this, um, a lot of de developers think they know publishers because they know their social media personalities. They're super friendly. They love posting memes. We're best friends. Um, that's a terrible sense of what the business side of the publisher is going to be like or what expectations they're going to have. So making sure they know the business side and what they're getting into is hugely important. Right. They know the biz dev guy who's been schmoozing them at, at, at GDC for the last couple of years. They don't know the publisher in general. So uh, they run a business. And the other one I want to talk about on that is, is not continuing to, to shop. Um, a, lot of, a lot of developers will say, oh, no, these guys said they're, they want to do the deal. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to go all in. We're going to wait for these guys. And then months go by and the publisher says, oh, no, we moved on. We did something else. So uh, the deal isn't done until it's signed, until that first payment comes in. Developers should continue to, to sort of shop on that. That's just, just a symptom of, of that optimism or that naivete. And this one, you know, I think we, we talked about a, a, a lot, um, viewing your game as, as art versus a business, right? Uh, independent developers in particular tend to want to get the game done, get the game out. Uh, it's their baby, it's their passion. They're not looking at this as an overall business. Uh, a, a good friend of mine used to say that uh, it's show business, right? If, if there, there's a business component to it, if, if you want to make art, find a patron. So this, this, is, this is not art. Bar when you meet at GDC or the Game Developers Conference late at night, um, and then in the morning you get the paperwork, and there's something completely different in there that maybe you overlook because you said it in the bar, so clearly it's going to be good. Um, failing to consult the right people, not talking to the folks that know the business dev folks, the lawyers, the accountants, the people in the industry who actually can give you good insight. Um, yeah, and, and I think what it really all all these reasons tend to boil down to sort of inexperience and naivete. The, the developers. Um, 
are so anxious to get a deal uh, with a publisher, and they're they're so happy to have it. Uh, they they've won out against ten other studios that might have been bidding on it. And they don't ask the right questions. They, they don't necessarily understand what they're signing up for. Yeah, the thing about working with developers is you're working with these wonderfully creative people who are focused on making something amazing. And your job as their counsel is to sit them down and be like, hey, so it's great. I love it. That's why people want to talk to you about it. But these are the actual business realities we're dealing with here. And this is how the industry actually functions, which can be a really hard conversation to have unless you're approaching it from a place where you do care about their product and about what they care about. Do they care about money? Do they care about what, what are their goals here? Yeah, and, and and again, depending on the the level of experience, uh, you know, a, a studio like Adams with Iron Galaxy doesn't have this problem in the same way that uh, you know a couple of students that just graduated and, have, and happen to make a really good student project that somebody might want to pick up are, are going to have. And you have to sort of, you really kind of have to break their hearts when you tell them that you know, no, these guys are uh, these guys are, are, are in business. Uh, they want to own your your IP. They want to do this. They want to do that. Uh, you don't make money till point A, B, or C. And you could just see them, their faces just sort of go white. And uh, you know, But they told me that we're going to do great things together. Yeah, you might do great things together, but that's not how, this, that's not how the deal structure is necessarily going to work. So now we know why, why people make the mistakes on the development side. Uh, let's talk about what the mistakes that I generally see uh, that they are. The first one is, is not getting your ducks in a row uh, before the deal. And, and what do we mean by that? Uh, a publisher is going to invest somewhere between you know, a million dollars and $20 million or $40 million into your studio. They see something for, you know, for a value and, uh, and see something of promise in working with you. They're not going to give it to some, you know, somebody who doesn't know how to sign a, you know, sign a payroll check, right? You have to, you have to prove to them that you're not just going to squander this. Uh, and I don't just mean by making a bad game, by, by running a bad operation. Having a clear, straightforward budget that you can present that actually says what you're burning their money on is a really good first step. And for a lot of people, it's not something they think about. They know how much their rent is. They know how much whatever else is, but they've never written it down and been able to approach someone and say, this is actually the burn rate we're running at. Um, and having that upfront before you approach a publisher, hugely important. And, and choosing the right entity and getting all your corporate documents in a row um, or lockdown is more important than than anybody uh, ever recognizes. Uh, I have a, a client that we did a deal for. Uh, again, spun out of a really big place. It was three guys. They had a, they have a great, great concept, great story to tell. Uh, we we got them incorporated. We helped them try to get everything settled. They didn't get that deal. So they didn't sign all their bylaws because they were focused on a twenty million dollar publishing deal, which. Understandably so. They, they, that 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 should be the focus. That deal was signed, and then a month or two later, they still didn't have their bylaws in order and everything. They realized that the th one of the three partners just really wasn't doing his job. They, he was just sort of phoning it in, and they said, "Okay, well, we want to we want to fire him." Well, let's look at your bylaws. Oh yeah, we don't have any. So there was no mechanism for two partners to kick out the third partner, or and, and they they still had the difficult conversation. But it cost them half a million dollars of that 20. And the publisher doesn't want to see the money go to kicking somebody out in severance. The publisher's like, that money goes into the game. That's what we signed up for. We didn't sign up for your problems. So getting this done, and that was for three months, three months of work by that one person. So uh, get, get that stuff in a row now, uh, early on, it's, it's worth it. It pays dividends. And in this case, would it literally saved them a half a million dollars. So, uh, I see, it's easy to understand why it doesn't happen because you and your, your two partners uh, shook hands and your friends, but that might not be the case a year from now, right? Uh, especially after you work together. You know, you don't always necessarily know how that's going to On that last point, um, with outsourcing and staffing plans, right now it may be great for you and three other folks to be working on your game, but you don't know how with production ramp up and everything else that's going to happen, your needs are going to change. Talking to other folks who have produced games or encouraging your clients to do so, doing the industry research so that you know future staffing needs and can build those into any kind of plan you're presenting, hugely important. All of this is ultimately part of what you're pitching to the publisher, uh, not just your game concept. Your game concept is only a part of what you're pitching. You're pitching the fact that, that, that you're worthwhile uh, to have them invest a certain amount of, uh, of money in with probably, hopefully, a lot of zeros on it. And, and tied to your, your staffing uh, and, and your outsourcing is organizing your business team. Uh, nobody necessarily expects you to have a full business staff for your, for your studio on day one. It's probably going to be two or three of you. 
but your your team, your extended team, should include an agent or somebody who's in charge of business development uh, who knows what they're doing. A little self-serving, admittedly, but you, you should have a lawyer as part of your team, right? Because you're you're going to need one pretty soon to to get your team in order, you, to get your company in order, to get your IP registered, and to negotiate these deals. Uh, so identify who's part of that team. You don't necessarily have to put it in the pitch document, uh, but you know don't wait to find one. Uh, I, you know, there's plenty plenty of clients of ours who, who call me up and say, "We're going to need you soon. We're not quite there yet. Are you gonna, are you going to be ready? Sure, let's have that conversation now." And I might not hear from them for six months, but other that's way better than having them call me and say, "Oh my God, we have a deal. I need you tomorrow." Right. Uh, so at least at least we're sort of on the ra- each other's radar screen, and we can sort of plan uh, plan around the timing. Uh, and then also, you may want to include an accountant, and you may want to include, uh, I think more importantly, your staffing and rec- recruiting solutions. So if you're telling the publisher, we're, we're at three people now, but on you know two months into this project, we're going to be at 20 people, uh, they want to know how you're going to get to 20. And saying, well, we know people might not be good enough, right? Tell, tell them how you're going to recruit these people. Tell them you know, how, how this is going to work. Make that part of your pitch, not necessarily, if not part of your budget. <clears throat> And you know how, how this impacts the ultimate deal you get from a publisher. Uh, in the case of an agent, it actually might help you get the deal in the first place. Uh, a lot of people are anti-agent. I, I'm actually a, a fan of having agents out there looking uh, looking for deals for for developers. They're better at it than than you are. Right? That, that's just the reality of it. They they know the landscape. They know what's out there. They know who to talk to. And and you're probably uh, they're not going to waste time talking to publishers that aren't going to do a deal. Uh, with you for your type of game because it doesn't fit with their portfolio or whatnot. Uh, obviously, all agents are different. Some are, are better and, and different than others. But uh, I, I'm personally a fan of agents. Um, having all of that stuff done bolsters your credibility with the publisher or, or your investors, right? Uh, they're they're, they're going to know, okay, well, they're working with this technology. They've got this staffing solution. They've got this agent who you know doesn't necessarily take bad clients. Uh, you know, they, they, they've got they've got a lawyer who I know that we can get a deal done with. This is this is helpful uh, for publishers, and I think it'll it'll give you a longer look when they're when they're evaluating your project, and potentially help you uh, negotiate a better deal. Yeah, those are the people that are going to help you put together your plan or your client's plan when they're going to publishers. Your accountant is going to be the one that's able to actually help you make sense of all those numbers we were talking about earlier. The lawyer is important for the deal negotiation, but also for preparing you for what kind of terms you may see and should expect, and what your deal options were, as covered in the previous presentation. Okay. If you're going to outsource your your uh, engineering, you should be outsourcing some of these other things. Those are equally as important functions. Uh, mistake number two is sort of your specifications and your milestones. Uh, more deals than I would like to see that I've seen over the years, the milestone schedule says description of what we delivered in month one, TBD. Money, $100,000, $200,000, $300,000. Month two, TBD. Month three, three. You don't know what you're delivering. They don't know what to approve, and they don't know what to pay you for. So, uh, get this done early as much as possible. I understand things happen on the fly. It isn't always uh, a given that you can do this, but it, it should be more of one. Yeah, you should move your flexibility to the body of the document uh, rather than leaving the milestones all to be determined. If you have clear specs, it actually assists both sides in figuring out what exactly is supposed to be done and what the publisher is spending their money on. And don't be afraid of an accurate, fully baked number and think it's too high, it's going to scare the publisher, this is what the publishers do. They fund games. They're, they're, they would rather see a number that's fully baked, accurate, even if it's a little higher than you think it is. Uh, at least they go into a deal with eyes wide open with what they're funding, rather than seeing six months later, oh, we didn't know about this cost. Oh, we didn't see this coming. So uh, lay it all out ahead of time. Uh, even more so now, uh, lay out your costs for live ops and post-launch uh, operations. Uh, that I don't think is done nearly enough uh, in, in this world. Everybody budgets from point A to point B and getting the game launched, and then there are costs the next day. And how are those going to get paid for? That's that's a conversation that needs to happen in almost every deal. Uh, and then obviously your tech licenses, your music licenses, those are costs uh, as well, whether it's Unreal or whether it's uh, you know a, a Beyonce song you want to put in your game. Figure it out, put it in your budget, and share that budget with your publisher. So feature creep is a huge issue that can come up. Um, You should always assume that there are going to be delays. You're always going to come up with the next great mechanic midway through development, and it's going to mess up your entire milestone schedule. 
So you should definitely add padding in there for that. And you should also add padding for how long it's going to take them to pay you. As we was discussed in the previous panel, um, publishers tend to pay you on the last day. So know that you're going to need in your budget that space and that time to make things move around the way that they need to to make sure that your expenses are covered and you can continue doing what the publisher is expecting you to do or expecting your client to do. Budgets never go completely on time or on, on budget because it's a collaborative, iterative process on the creative side. So you do something good for your publisher and, and, and they go, oh, that's cool. Can, you, can we tweak it and go this direction? That's, that's just a function of time and money. And, and that's going to change your staffing. That's going to maybe you need more artists. Maybe you need to sort of you know, do something a little bit different. Uh, you have to plan for that as much as you can and know it's going to occur. And you have to plan your contract to to allow you to renegotiate or to add some costs as those things happen. Um, and, and as Suzanne said, you know, from the time that you submit your work in in most of these models, not obviously the burn rate model that, that Adam and I, Adam and I talked about, from the time you submit your work to the time you're paid for that work. I think you have to assume 45 to 60 days, even on something that goes through pretty smoothly. Uh, assume a worst case scenario. Assume it's going to get kicked back once and they're going to say, no, uh, we reject it, fix this. And that starts the clock again. So uh, you have to plan your cash flow and your budget accordingly. And that's a mistake that almost every uh, developer on, on the smaller side uh, does in, in my experience. They, they end up saying, well, if you don't approve this milestone and pay me it tomorrow, we're going to miss payroll and everybody's going to walk out the door. Publishers don't like to hear that once. They certainly don't like to hear it more than once. And that means that they can never reject your milestone. Otherwise, they lose the whole deal. That's the fact that you're putting your publishing partner in a bad position. They won't want to continue to invest in you. Uh, and again, aim for some sort of quantifiable approval guidelines if possible. It's not always easy, um, but uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like uh, language-wise. But if it's, la if it's a milestone that they say, we can approve it, if we want, if we think it looks nice, yeah. then you, you can't hit a moving target as, as, I, as I like to tell some of our developer clients. Uh, aim for something that you know that you can literally check the box. Yeah, we did this, we delivered that, pay us. Other benefits of specking early is, is exactly what we, we just said. So uh, put you on the same page and, uh, and, and it keeps the money flowing. Yeah. So you're going to want to avoid the language that we were talking about where it's entirely at the publisher's discretion. I don't want it in purple, so I'm rejecting it, is not a fair reason on behalf of your developer clients. Um, you want really clear language in the milestone document, and you also want really clear language in the contract saying that they're not going to unreasonably reject a milestone and start that clock again and push your payroll further out. Yeah, and so here's, here's two sample pieces of language. Uh, one sort of puts you at a disadvantage as a, as a developer and one that you, you would strive for. I'm not saying you're going to get it, and it's not necessarily something that uh, you can always get to, uh, but this type of thing is, is something you ought to be thinking about or at least identifying as part of the, part of the potential problem. And then having good change order language, as we mentioned, you know, if, if in that iterative process the, the, the game shifts here, you need a mechanism in your contract to say, hey, this is going to change the dates, this is going to change the budget, this is going to change our staffing. Let's have that discussion. And, and here's a sample language that, that we've seen uh, in a lot of deals that sort of gets to the heart of that. At the end of the day, the day, you have to agree to what that change is, but it, you're at least laying the groundwork for the fact that you're going to come to them. It's important to note with your clients when approaching this kind of language too, that it may seem kind of combative or like things are going to change or we don't know what we're doing or something like that. Um, but it's perfectly standard. Things change. This is a huge project and taking a huge amount of time. The market changes, the needs of the publisher change. So setting yourself up to have that conversation rather than having to renegotiate the whole deal around this kind of change, hugely important. There are, there are aggressive asks that a developer can make to a publisher. This isn't one of them. Right? I've never seen a publisher go, that's outrageous. I'm, not too, you know, I'm walking away from the deal because you're asked for something like this. You ask for IP ownership or you ask for a 70% royalty, you might get a different reaction. But, but asking for something like this, uh, you're, you're just having an honest conversation about how your production might go. IP ownership and the underlying elements. So this was a question we got in the last panel that we're, we're going to talk about now. Uh, mistakes are made relative to negotiating or dealing with what you own uh, in, in a publisher deal. So uh, games, games are intellectual property uh, and it's important to sort of delineate what, what you own versus what's sort of getting handed over to the publisher. 
So the underlying tech is what we were talking about before, where if you have a game and you want to reskin it after the deal falls through, um, a lot of developers are known for making a consistent type of game, whether it be a match three game or a shooter. So that technology, that code is already developed for previous projects or portions of it anyway. And they're going to be reusing similar code throughout the project. When a publisher asks for the IP for a game, make sure you aren't transferring them or you aren't letting your client transfer to them their entire lifeblood. Um, you can totally transfer the characters, the storyline, anything like that, that they may want in exchange for a better deal for your client. But you do want to make sure that your client can retain the ability to make money on future projects. And it, you never know. I mean, this, this could be far more important than, than you think. You know, one of our clients had some retained intellectual property that really wasn't tied to, the, tied to a particular game project. And they were like, oh, wow, this is actually a pretty good tool. We can license this out and make money, not in a game, just in a whole different fashion. They didn't realize it. And the publisher uh, who actually realized that as well when they when they were looking at it within the game that they had contracted for said, well, this is great. Let's do something with this. And they looked at the contract and go, oh, that turns out it's not ours now. That's like we screwed up. We let them retain certain IP. This could be important, right? It, uh, it, it could be something that either at least saves you time and money on your next project or uh, or something far, far bigger than that or far more direct. That last point there, um, in taxes and valuation and everything of that nature, is where you're going to want to talk to that accountant in terms of what the publisher takes if you're representing the publisher or in terms of what the developer is keeping because it is going to impact your taxes and how you're valued in future projects. So um, holding on to underlying tech rights, like we said, um, this is basically what we said in the previous slide, plus non-compete. So you want to be able to, if you are a company that makes shooters, if you're a company that makes uh, match threes, you don't want the publishing agreement to contain a clause that stops you from making match three games or shooter games or games that compete with a game you've made for this publisher for a period of time because it's really going to limit your options for income going forward. Um, so being aware of things like non-compete obligations is hugely important. Yeah, and, and re retaining your IP is only part of it, right? If you retain the IP that helps you make these generic shooter games, that's great. But if, on the other hand, two pages later, you have a non-compete, well, now you've retained IP you can't use. So, uh, so, so you have to sort of think about what you're retaining and how that affects things in, in, in the big picture. And obviously, non-competes come in many different flavors. Um, so if it's a one-year non-compete, well, that title is still viable, and you have other games on the back burner that you can go work on during that time and then come back to this kind of game after that year is up, maybe that's a negotiation point you use for your client to get other things they may be interested in. And some of the sample language for, for that is, is here. Uh, again, not an outrageous ask. So with normal non-compete clauses, there's obviously been judicial precedent that they're limited in terms of you can't keep someone from their livelihood for an unreasonable amount of time. Has there been any video game specific ruling on that that you guys are aware of where a court has looked at it and said, this developer only makes one kind of game. Everyone who works here is depending on them being able to make and sell this one type of game, and therefore we can't let you enforce that. I have not seen anything on a on a corporate level that that will sort of negate a non compete individual level. Absolutely right. That, but but this is this is a company saying we won't make this other kind of game, and that's part of the consideration for doing the deal. I've not seen it work that way. It, you know, on a on a company, and, and the developer at the end of the day is a company, right? Question. Yeah, hi. Um, forgive me if you covered this. I have to take care of all emergencies. But I can imagine this could be uh, an issue for either independent developers or those representing independent developers. Have you thought about the importance of getting a written assignment of copyright from any friend or consultant or contractor who provides code or an image or anything that is subject? We have not covered that on this panel, but that it's certainly a huge issue. So th this, this one in particular is more focused on the publisher of a developer relationship, and that comes up as part of sort of uh, the publisher due diligence, uh, making sure that they own, that you as a developer own everything that you're providing. But uh, yeah, it's a hugely important issue uh, as far as that, that first mistake of getting your ducks in a row and getting organized as well. Uh, making sure that you, you own all the rights to the game that you're 
you're pitching and that you're purporting to make, uh, whether it's your, uh, your, your co-owners of, or co-members of your LLC, uh, ma making sure that all, everything's properly contributed uh, at, at the outset or on an ongoing basis is a huge, huge issue. And there's almost certainly going to be um, some kind of indemnification in that contract where when you transfer your, your IP to the publisher, or even if you keep it and they're involved in it for marketing or whatever purposes, and someone who has that copyright originally that you haven't assigned to the company comes back and says, but wait, that's my duck, um, they can actually cause a lot of problems for you and for the publisher, but it all comes back on you due to those kinds of indemnification clauses. Right, that's the uh, next point I'm going to get to, the discussion about the developers is what he increases liability here because there's going to be a very aggressive indemnification. I bring this up whenever I get a chance because there are an awful lot of good business and corporate attorneys who have no idea this is how copyright law works. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And and the, 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 the level of sort of uh, heavy handedness of that indemnification also is going to depend on the deal that you're, you're, you're striking, right? If, if it's, if it's a pure work for hire deal where the publisher is saying, make this, do this, and it's, you know, we want you to port a game, uh, we want to port Call of Duty from, uh, you know, from this platform to another one. Uh, as a developer, I don't want to indemnify a uh, publisher. I don't make any war reps and warranties about content. It's not my content. I'm doing what you asked me to do, right? That's your problem, publisher, not mine. So, so again, you have to look at what the deal is or what the game you're, you're contracting to make because that's going to uh, sort of impact the reps and warranties you're going to make about it. It's a completely original IP. The publisher's going to say, you know, stand behind it, tell me it's original because I don't want to get sued. And that's legit. Uh, but if it's, if it's something the publisher's directing you to do, uh, you're, you're taking a business risk if you're, if you're repping and warranting any authenticity on something that you didn't, you didn't create yourself. Uh, anyway, so going back to the, the developer tools and technology, so here's really generic sample language of how it ought to look. Right? Uh, sometimes you'll see a schedule that says, uh, the, the developer tools and tech listed on Schedule A are expressly reserved and owned by the developer or whatever. But it's it's not usually very hotly contested uh, as far as as far as this goes with the publisher. They expect that there probably are some underlying proprietary tools that the developer is going to use, as long as that doesn't impact the publisher's ability to continue using the using them in the game. So usually there's there's a license for them to use use the, the tools and tech in the game you're providing, uh, but you retain the ownership of that particular asset. Uh, Non-compete, so here's some sample language on the non-compete side uh, that, that we put up, unless approved by publisher in writing and for a period of five years from the expiration of the, of the agreement, developer will not directly or indirectly assist in the development of any product that the publisher deems to be similar. Well, this is awful language, right? Uh, the particular deal that we're talking about was a perpetual term. So the deal is five years from forever. Uh, it's completely in publisher's discretion whether the game is similar or not. So they can tell you, no, you can't do that uh, or you're violating this contract. And in this particular language that you know, I pulled from a contract, this was for a company to port something over to the Wii U. So uh, you don't get to, as a publisher, have a non-compete uh, with a developer that says, I can't do something for five years because you're, you're paying them on a time and materials basis to do a port. So, uh, and you could retain all the tools and technology you want, but if you have bad language like this two pages later, you've undermined all of the things that you decided to keep for yourself. So, uh, and, and this, this language, I would never allow in an agreement to, to, to occur, and no publisher will stand behind that, right? They're, they're, they threw it in there, and it just shows you, uh, it shows you that this particular publisher was actually pretty unsophisticated, um, and, and they backed off of this pretty easily. So, uh, but there, there are bad pieces of language out there that you could step into accidentally and, and, and undermine your entire business. On that note, a lot of the language, a lot of the times when you see language like this, it's from a smaller publisher who perhaps doesn't have the amount of legal counsel of an EA or an Activision. Um, so they're going to back off pretty easily. They aren't putting these in there to be blatantly evil. Um, contrary to popular belief, most lawyers and people that write contracts aren't pure evil. Um, so having that honest conversation with someone that you're developing a long-term relationship with on behalf of your client um, is the best way to handle these kinds of clauses that seem just outlandish. Mistake number four, uh, termination and transition. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking about how bad things are going to end and 
and awful scenarios where uh, where you've got to part ways and um, you know that that's probably not a good thing for my my personal relationships but uh, but that's just part of the gig we have to think about the worst case scenario as lawyers uh, for our clients and I'd say we spend a disproportionate amount of every deal talking about termination scenarios and what happens uh, and you have to bad things happen in every deal uh, hopefully not to the level of termination but you cannot assume that these things are going to run smoothly and on time and on budget so uh, the one thing I think that most independent and smaller developers really are scared of is talking about bad things with the publisher they think the publisher is going to say well if you're already talking about what happens when we break when we break up effectively uh, why should we even start dating right and that's not the case. Don't be afraid to have this conversation with your publishers. They're expecting it. Right? And, and you'll, you'll figure out pretty quickly where they'll move or where they can't move. But it, you have to have these conversations. You, the, the, the termination scenarios and provisions that are you're going to see from a publisher on the first draft are, are definitely not in your favor. And there's room, there's room for them to move almost every single time. This is another point at which you as the attorneys in the room are going to need to help your clients understand the realities of the way these types of relationships works. They're used to, if they're a first time developer working with a publisher, um, handshake deals, friend DAs, which are just this whole other thing. Um, so they're not used to having these conversations about when everything goes wrong or if you can't pay us or if I can't give you what you're expecting. And they don't want to have those conversations, but being able to have those conversations on their behalf can actually be really comforting for them. We talked about this in the last panel, uh, termination for convenience and kill fees. Almost every one of the, the business models that we talked about uh, in, in the prior panel has a scenario where the publisher can, can pull the plug and walk away. Uh, it happens far more than you think. I'd say, I don't know, I, I don't know percentage-wise, but I've probably seen a hundred deals cancel for convenience in in twenty years. So it, it happens, right? It's it's a, it's a regular occurrence. Um, publishers always going to include some uh, clause so they can do it. And the question is sort of how that works relative to money, and also how that works relative to the intellectual property. Uh, the intellectual property is uh, a trickier one uh, than the money because money's just solvable. It's money. Uh, but I think the real key here is, um, and, and, you know, it's it, just like we talked about before, understanding your project, planning it out and specking it out. You need to plan out what happens if, uh, if the project gets pulled at different stages. How long is it realistically going to take for us to find another home for that, self-fund it? How can we lay off enough people to keep things going uh, and not kill the studio? Because, uh, the, this is a this is a viable likelihood in almost every deal you enter into. So um, this is another point at which you're going to have to talk to your client about what sorts of things are most important to them. Are they getting into this deal for the money, or are they getting into this deal because they want their game to see mass exposure? If they're getting into this game because they want, or getting into the deal because they want their game to see mass exposure, you're going to be more interested in making sure that the IP reverts to them or that they keep the IP than you are necessarily going to be interested in a really high kill fee. If they're just in it for the money so that they can keep their studio running, the kill fee may be the direction to go and let the publisher keep the IP in the event of an at-will termination. Right, and, and and balancing that ask or balancing how you're going to structure that is important. Obviously, if you can, get both, right? You know, get, get the IP back and a high kill fee, but that might not be a viable solution. So you have to sort of look and assess that with your client before you approach these, these provisions in a contract. And as I mentioned... What happens to the IP if they pull the plug for con for convenience? It, nobody's fault. They just don't want to be in business with you anymore. Uh, what happens? And what happens at different stages? You know, if it happens at a certain point uh, prior to launch or after launch, you know, how does it work then? Um, and and then everything else that comes from it, future options and uh, and and spinoffs. Do they survive? I've seen deals where publisher pulls the plug on the game, releases the game anyway, and then says to the developer. Oh, by the way, we have a first look on your next game. That didn't that didn't terminate. That's I mean, that's a pretty aggressive, crazy thing to say, but I've I've heard it said. So you have to tie the language in on termination to a whole bunch of other things. It's not just about this game. And again, what happens if somebody else finishes the game? Are you gonna get a royalty? There, you know, if you're not careful, you could do a whole bunch of work. The, the the publisher realizes they might have a hit, they terminate you right at launch hand it over to somebody else to, to launch it and they don't have to pay your royalty potentially. So you have to figure out how your, you know, how your deal structures 
uh, mirror, mirror the realities that you might face. And then, uh, you know, live ops is becoming a bigger issue, I think, for most of our deals. Uh, you know, you, you want to yeah, talk a little bit about that? Um, definitely. So termination post-launch, this is the same page as those royalties we were talking about. If they transfer to another company right at the time of termination, which happens to be the time of launch, and another company is handling DLC and patching and um, back-end operations, um, whose obligations are it to keep the game live, and how does that work out? Who owns the IP? Who's in charge of the DLC? Who's getting paid how much when if you decide to launch a, another character in the game? So, yeah, again, just, just to reiterate, and I'll, and I'll breeze through this, this, this slide, but you have to think about these things ahead of time. Before, uh, before you sign your deal, certainly, and before you negotiate your deal, uh, you have to have an understanding of, of what might occur and what you're going to do when, if and when it occurs, uh, just in case. Because you don't want to be surprised by a termination. That's the, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it could happen at the end, at the end of the year. Uh, I, I've had clients who, who got a termination notice on Christmas. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it was an at-will termination. It had, it had the, the, the requisite kill fee, but it was still Christmas. It hurt, right? Uh, but they had already thought this through, and, they, and it wasn't the end of the world. Right? It wasn't part of, you know, it, was, it was okay. Uh, you know, the, the optics of it might not, might not have looked great, but, uh, you know, it, but it was fine. They, they, they all got Christmas bonuses because of it. Yeah, right? your clients aren't only negotiating this, them for the, themselves. They're also negotiating this for all of their potential and current employees. You want to be able to keep your company happy and moving forward, even the event that everything falls through. And an at-will termination language generally looks something like this. Publisher may in its sole discretion terminate the, the title without cause upon written notice, and then such event, they'll pay developer a fee to the then current milestone. Uh, well, generally speaking, it should be all previously unpaid milestones that, that have been submitted and approved, the milestone in process at the time of termination, and a kill fee not just the then current one. I, I've had deals where the publisher killed it and said, we're going to pay you for this milestone. Well, there were four milestones behind. And they're like, well, we don't have to pay those now. We don't have to pay the ones that are stacked up because we didn't do our job. We only have to pay you for the one. Well, that's that's not the spirit of the deal. And you want to make sure your contract actually reflects what, what, what the intent is. So previously unpaid milestones. And any publisher who argues that the previously unpaid milestones shouldn't be included in this clause, I'd be worried about there's no reason for them to not agree to that language. But you have to ask for it. You have to know to ask for it. And transition language. So this one's a little tougher um, when you're either winding down a game or you're going to transition it uh, after termination back to the, the developer or uh, something like that. How that's going to occur, and you're basically saying we're going to work in good faith to transition in an orderly fashion, but if the termination had some level of acrimony to it, you're then saying, okay, I hate you, you owe me this money, but let's cooperate here. So this is always a little bit tricky, but language tends to look something like this, that they're going to wind down operations over 60 days and transition uh, you know, the, the users back over and, and whatever. And then you get into privacy issues about you know, the, the, the information that the, the individual came into or you know, agreed to have the publisher have. Now you've got to transfer that information. That, that isn't, it isn't always easy. Uh, I, I've not seen an orderly transition on a deal like this uh, occur, regardless of the language. And buyback language, so we talked a little bit about that as well. After termination, the if the publisher retains the IP at, after the termination, the developer might want a chance to buy it back, either directly or through another publisher. Uh, so language like that often is built into the contract that says you're going to have a certain period of time to uh, to buy back the IP as long as publisher gets all of its costs that it sunk in, uh, not just the development fees, but any sort of marketing costs or spend uh, that they've, they've had. Um, and in return for that, they'll, you, you, you get the IP back. Um, the reality is that you don't really need a time frame on this because you could always approach the publisher and say, I've got a deal for you. And uh, saying it's an amount equal to the development costs, that's what publisher wants. They want all their money back. But if you go to them and say, uh, I found a publisher, I found funding, and it's I'll pay you back 75 cents on the dollar. Publisher might do that. They terminated the contract anyway, and if they don't have any plans for that IP, 75 cents on the dollar is better than zero. Uh, and I've seen deals where they'll take less than what they sunk in and just to just to get out of it and salvage as much money as they can. But normally, if another publisher is involved stepping in, they want all their money. 
Yeah, knowing the tone of the relationship when you approach on buyback is very important. Knowing how the relationship ended, um, what kind of terms the publisher was on with the developer, things of that nature. Talking to your client about those weird emotional situations that can come up when you end a project together um, can give you a sense of what you're going to get in terms of buyback options. Yeah. But, you know, again, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the, the language that you ought to have in every deal. This is, you know, this is just sample language that, that sort of gets the idea across. Uh, each deal is different and you sort of have to tailor it uh, as much as possible. And then, so those are the, the most common mistakes or the most common areas of the, of the relationship and the contract uh, that we see. There's other ones that are a little bit sort of more uh, generic. Uh, this, this is always my favorite. This is our standard language. You know, you, this is not negotiable. I, I'm clearly talking to the wrong person. Everything is negotiable. Can I talk to, you know, everybody has a boss, as I've said. Let's talk to somebody else because that's just not a good answer. Uh, and you know, neither is, oh, we don't do that. Well, what do you mean we don't do that? Well, uh, we will terminate your contract for convenience. Um, and, uh, it says here, we have the discretion to either pay you a kill fee or not pay you a kill fee. Well, let's take out the discretion part. Let's have an automatic kill fee. Well, we can't change the language, but we would never, you know, we would never not pay you a kill fee. Well, it says here you could. So, uh, let's just get rid of that. Well, no, uh, we don't, we don't do that. We don't change this language. All right. So if you're telling me you could do that, I'm assuming you are going to do that, right? And that, that's sort of our job as the lawyers. So, uh, so, so get rid of that, that option, get rid of that ambiguity. Um, and marketing, boy, marketing is <laughs> difficult uh, negotiation uh, now. But uh, a lot of times now, a developer will get a, a publisher to commit to a marketing uh, amount or marketing spend or certain initiatives, and, ha and that becomes a core contractual obligation in the deal. Um, publishers will often say, "Oh no, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna commit a million dollars to marketing here." How? Well, we're not gonna tell you that. Well, then it's not really much of a contractual obligation. So, uh, so, so building that into the deals is uh, yeah, that's a great place for an attachment to say the types of events or the types of publications or websites where you're going to be seeing that spend happen, um, because that money can all go to one event once, one time in the year, and then that's all you have and that's your marketing and your game actually isn't out there in the hands of the consumers that are actually interested in it. As a developer, I think you're better off having the publisher list out what they're going to do rather than just put a sort of generic dollar amount out there, right? Uh, I'd rather say you're going to, you know, you're going to have, you know, you're going to get it featured here, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do these Twitter blasts and you're going to do, you know, whatever. Uh, you're going to display it at E3 uh, rather than tell, tell me you're going to spend a million dollars on more. And that's not a complicated ask from yeah. a publisher. Um, are you seeing any like any changes where with now marketing you're talking about streamers and that sort of deal and not just traditional? Yeah, I mean if that's part of the marketing strategy, that's fine. And there's just, there's going to be a spend to that, uh, you know, as well. I'd rather say I'd rather have the publisher commit to, you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna engage a couple of streamers and we're gonna do this, this, and this, rather than tell me that they're gonna put a hundred thousand dollars towards a streaming strategy, right? Um, you know, again, the the, the money. As a developer, the money is not that relevant. You don't care how many dollars they spend. You just want it spent effectively. Yeah, and that level of specificity where they're going to go after this particular streamer is not a difficult thing to ask a publisher for because they have marketed games before. They know what works and what doesn't, and they have marketing plans internally. Asking to see those isn't a huge issue for them. So if they've worked with a streamer in the past, you should be able to ask about what that streamer's sell rate is or what, the, what effect they have on sales in the future. Um, another common mistake is not paying attention to the boilerplate of the agreement. Uh, you know, the, the boilerplate for the developers in the room, the boilerplate tends to be all the stuff in the back that looks like standard terms and it's usually in different smaller print and uh, sometimes it'll say standard terms and conditions. Um, it, that stuff is important. There's some, there's some really negotiable uh, things that will impact your deal and your relationship that are buried in there. Uh, probably the most obvious one is, is the audit right. Um, sometimes an audit right isn't even in a deal, and that's obviously the first thing you want to you want to put back. If there's a if there's a back end royalty uh, that they're gonna they're gonna pay you and say, oh, here's your ten percent of, uh, of of profit on the game. Trust us, this is right. Well, no, we we need to be able to audit you and, and confirm that. We want to check your records. We want to check your books. We want to check your expenses to make sure uh, that it's matching up. Uh, I, I have more than one client who tells their publishing partners out of the gate. By the way, just so you know. We audit after the first year. 
period. And if we just plan for it, assume it. Uh, that way they, they, they don't, the publisher doesn't feel sort of like, you don't trust us? Oh, you know, sometimes if you, if you do it right, like we were talking about with the breach letters earlier, if you just say to them, uh, you know, we don't believe you, we're, we're, we're auditing you. That's not going to be good for your relationship. But if you do it in the right way and say, look, this is part of our standard practice. We just want to double check some things. We want to make sure the expenses were, were done right, uh, you know, that, that you deducted the things that you're allowed to and, and you've got backup for them. Almost every royalty statement I've ever seen, the first couple of times that, that, that they've been sent is wrong. It's not... It's not nefarious. It's not anybody trying to pull it over. The accounting department just does it, does it the way that they did it for the other 20 deals, not recognizing that this deal might have been a little different. That's going to happen. So you, had, you should have that ability to double check. And again, negotiating that clause is not that difficult. It's something you might want to think about. Yeah, what else? Credit is huge, um, especially for people's first project. And if this isn't maybe their long-term plan to just be a solo developer or a small team developer, and they're looking to move on to bigger and better things, making sure that you will get credit, even if you don't own the IP at the end of the deal, um, is important. Another thing on this list that is important to smaller developers is governing law and jurisdiction. If you have a client here in Illinois and it says that anything's going to be hashed out in California, is your client have the time and money to go to California or to send you to California, which I mean, not going to complain, but um, to send you to California to hash that out on their terms, on their turf? Or is there another jurisdiction that you can talk about that would be more reasonable for your client? Because the publisher is going to be the one who has the money and the time and the legal force to go to where they need to go. And, and again, you may not have the leverage in the deal to get the, the publisher to move on this, but you never know until you try. So, I, you know, so I, again, I had a client years ago. Uh, they were doing a deal and the, and the jurisdiction for the contract was, was Lyon, France. And, and my client was in Poland. And when we negotiated the deal, I said, you should really try to move this from Lyon because the corporate office for this company is in Lyon. And that probably gives away who, who, which publisher it is. But uh, they said, ah, don't worry about it. Nothing ever bad is going to happen here. Well, there was a lawsuit. The lawsuit occurred in Lyon, and look at and lo and behold, uh, the developer lost that case, and they lost uh, a lot of money on that case because it was in the backyard of a large employer in the city of Lyon. Right? Uh, could they have moved it? Yeah, I actually think they could have. This is a company that had, uh, the developer had a very very valuable uh, franchise that they've gone pu they went public on the Warsaw, Warsaw Stock Exchange over. So it, they certainly had money. They could have argued for, for certain to at least get it to, I don't know, London, right? Some, somewhere not in Lyon, right? And they just didn't, they didn't think about that. No, don't worry about it. It'll never happen. Don't, don't assume that. Let, you know, let us tell you, uh, let your lawyers tell you the, the bad things that might happen and give it a shot. They didn't even try. Yeah. I just a comment on that. I had a situation months ago where the client came to me. They took another company's uh, contract and used it in the negotiation with the party that they ended up litigating with. Neither party paid attention to the new jurisdiction. One party is here in Chicago. Another is in Texas, and they ended up litigating. <laughs> so that's another thing to watch out for as well. So it's not just the developers that don't pay attention to the boilerplate. Sometimes it's the <laughs> publishers and sometimes it's both of their lawyers, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, obviously that shouldn't happen. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and, and, and look, we're, we're, we're a litigious society in general, uh, Americans, and, uh, but, but even more so in San Francisco than in Texas <laughs> and, and in Illinois. So that probably wasn't the best venue for one of them. So uh, yeah, that, uh, that's something that should have, should have been uh, addressed. There was one other thing on the previous slide I wanted to touch on. Uh, we've only got about five minutes left. So um, mutuality of clauses is something that you can always push for. If they want indemnification, um, maybe you should consider or speak to your lawyer or speak to your client about whether or not that needs to be mutual. The same with confidential materials. If you're providing player lists to the publisher, that should not be something that there's no confidentiality on. And indemnity, I think, is, is more important than ever uh, relative to uh, privacy claims, right? You know, and, and, and liabilities there. Uh, you know, when, when you're collaborating with your publisher and you're sharing information, uh, who, who should bear that responsibility if something goes wrong? And, and that's, that's something that you've got to think about and address. Uh, so here's some sample audit language. Again, it's 
uh, not something I would say is the, the gold standard or something you, you, you want to have in every deal, but this gives you the idea and it's sort of a who, what, where, when, and why. Who can audit? What can they audit? When can the audit occur? Uh, you know, and, and why, if you're limiting the reason, if you can only audit it to confirm uh, accuracy of, of royalty payments, or not, not just, uh, you know, not, not just, uh, you know, the, the validity of some of the expenses, right? Uh, and, and audit language is, it's funny, publishers, some publishers want to have an audit provision working in their favor where they can audit the developer to make sure that, uh, that the developer is putting the resources on it that they said. And, and I've gone to that, uh, against that for some of our clients on in many occasions. You have visibility over every deliverable. So you know what you're getting is what you paid for. I don't care if we put 15 or 16 people on it. It's not, that's not your problem. And, and, and that's sort of the argument you make towards the publishers. And the publishers, publishers are worried that you're going to get 15 interns and go buy yourself a Ferrari with that money. Uh, so I would argue that that's lazy on the publisher's side. Do your homework ahead of time and, and, and understand what our staffing is. And, if we violate a staffing plan, we're in breach, but don't necessarily have an audit right for it. Uh, but anyway, so this is audit language uh, that's not dissimilar from the type that we'd see. Question? Yeah, that, that, that didn't have it, but yeah, that, that absolutely. So if the, if the audit uh, shows a discrepancy of more than 5 or 10%, then the, the, the payment of the auditor's fees will shift, right? Nobody's going to want to pay all the fees for the auditor, you know. That's right. Yeah. And uh, no, that's exactly right. So the developer generally pays for the cost of the audit uh, unless the discrepancy is, is significant and not really just a mis an honest mistake. If it's 5 or 10% or more, then you can sort of assume it was a, a little bit more nefarious. And in that case, the burden shifts back to the publisher to, to pay those costs. And sometimes those costs are capped. Sometimes it's reasonable costs and things along those lines. So all, all that's negotiable in there. Uh, that, that, that sample didn't have it, but that's, that's part of the, the, the normal equation. Uh, here's some sample credit language again. Uh, every, every deal and every provision is a little bit different uh, on that. But um, you know, the, the, the one thing I think that most developers wish they'd gone back for is to say, look, after the game's released, we, we want to at least be able to say we were involved, right? Um, you know, on our on our website, this was a project we worked on. Uh, on our pitch documents, uh, you know, to other publishers, and not be violating a contract. So it, again, it's it's not too difficult to to navigate through some credit language. It's just something that you want to take a look at. Uh, you know, do you want to be on all press releases? Yeah, of course you probably do. It's not necessarily going to be viable if the press release is about how this game is going to be uh, incorporating Unreal into into it, and they're not necessarily going to talk about the developer too much. I think that's it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're done. We have time for a couple questions? Probably two or three. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Just back to the credit thing real quick. Um, we as developers also allow like our artists to, like our artists are able to do the work they did for our game for their kind of their portfolio that they're setting up. Uh -huh. Like how does that, I don't even know how to do it, that chain, like we as developers say you can use the credit but then no, don't do that. Yeah, I mean, if, if depending on what your credit language says in your deal with the publisher, uh, you you telling your people to go ahead and do that might be breaching the contract, theoretically. Um, now, are, are publishers going to generally police that and care too much? Probably not. Uh, but they again, they can. If the contract says they can, you know, you could you could be worried about that. Uh, you know, I guess you could envision a scenario where the publisher doesn't necessarily want to tout a developer is involved and they want to say this was all our own brainchild and we want to take credit for it and, and, and minimize your contribution and they might be a little bit more aggressive than that. So you want to sync up what you're letting your employees do to the language that you, you have here. And sometimes you can add language that says exactly that to your publishing deal. Like we'll let our employees, again, post-release, you don't want to jump the gun and, you know, and then say I did, all, I did this for this great game and the game hasn't been announced yet. Uh, but after release of the game and everything, they, they, they shouldn't care as much. So it's also something where you'll want to consider who owns the IP, mm -hmm. um, because if you own the IP and you have rights to it there, you're definitely going to be able to disseminate those rights better to your employees than you would if the publisher owns all of the IP. How flexible? Well, they, they, you used to be. It used to be that you would do. The, territorial rights 
a lot because that was always on, on retail product, right? Uh, so you'd have like a you'd have different distributors and and, and different publishers in different regions. Uh, you still see it. Um, you know, I, we we represent an MMO that was uh, you know that that basically did European rights and then they would sell Russian rights and uh, and and you always have to do that with China, right? You know, you have to have different rights in China anyway. Uh, you you need to have a separate publisher there or, or a Chinese uh, partner. Uh, so you know that happens all the time, and that's that's a, a usually a, a, you know, significant deal. But for the most part, digital games tend to be uh, worldwide rights as much as possible, or you know maybe not China. Uh, there certainly are exceptions, and some people will try to carve out places where they think they can uh, they, they don't need the same publisher or the capabilities aren't aren't as good. Uh, you know, Turkey uh, comes to mind as one as well. Uh, and uh, uh, lately, Russia it, it used to be one. Um, you know, so so again, if if somebody, if your publisher has those rights and they're not actually going to be doing anything other than sub licensing them, then you might as well retain them and sub license them yourself, and and you know get a, and get a better deal, uh, or at least keep more of that that revenue if you can. Uh, but but the other thing to think about is having a different royalty structure if if your publisher is only going to just sub license it, right? If you know if you're only getting, let's say you're getting ten percent across the board. Well, you should get more if they're not doing any work to just sublicense it to a Russian company. Maybe you should get 50-50, right? So, so you have to sort of think about your deal and what might happen there and, and think about how that affects the economics. One more? Anybody? No? Okay. I got one from online here. Okay. Um, you were talking a little bit about digital distribution, something we want to digital versus traditional retail. Um, what are some regrets, if any, that you've encountered? clients doing digital distribution after the fact. If they're looking back at a publishing deal that they had in regards to digital distribution, are there any maybe words of advice you can give to Well I, I, the, the the one thing that comes to mind is sort of adding digital rights to to a title under the same economic terms isn't necessarily gonna be the case because uh, you know for example in, in a in a retail deal you'd have uh, the publisher would have a, a a reserve of money that they would hold back, and sometimes it was upwards of twenty percent, and that was usually for defective product, you know, return goods and bad boxes, of, you know, on retail. Um, and if you just allow a publisher on the uh, on the digital side to roll into that and keep twenty percent of your money, there are no bad boxes. They don't need to keep twenty percent of your money on the digital side. They might need to keep two percent for bad credit cards, right? Uh, so, uh, so the economics of those deals works differently, and, and probably the the bigger one. Uh, on the old retail deals, they were reporting and paying you, the publishers were reporting and paying the developers on a, usually on a quarterly basis, because that's when they were getting their reports from the, the various retail outlets, the GameStops and the Targets and whatnot. Uh, but digital deals tend to be on a monthly basis because you know your reporting comes in much more regularly. So if you just roll into an old school deal and just add in some digital rights, you're, you're, you probably should have been getting paid monthly, but you've agreed to get paid quarterly. So that that probably be the two major differences. One of the regrets I've seen on digital deals that maybe folks overlook is um, keys and using keys for marketing and how many keys your publisher can use for marketing and just leaving that number open to whatever they want to use or whatever it's price they want to set during sales. Um, having some degree of control over what you're actually making in market that isn't impacted by the uh, publisher using sales to cut into your royalty is a big regret. That's a great question. Um, most publishers are going to require the developers to have general liability and errors and omissions insurance as part of the agreement, uh, naming the publisher as an additional insured in most cases. The level of that coverage sort of depends. Um, generally speaking, the publisher is going to want to have it at around the value of what they're paying on development fees. Uh, and sometimes that's more than the developer has or is able to afford and, and they didn't bake it into their budget properly. So, uh, but there is always going to be an insurance obligation in, in, in those contracts, or there should be. Uh, where I've seen movement on it is sometimes the, the developer, if they're really indie in a startup, the publisher will say, you've got to get it within 90 days. You don't have to have it on signature, but you've got to get it. And they might put in as part of a milestone three months later, you know, one of the deliverables is your insurance certificate, right? Uh, show us that you got it. Uh, otherwise, you're in breach on day one of the sig after signature because you don't have it. Right? So, but yeah, it's it's a reality. It's out there. Um, 
you know, if it's too much, uh, if it's too cost prohibitive relative to the coverage you carry, some developers will ask the, the publisher to cover that overage or that extra cost. Like say, we always carry a million dollars. That's part of our business operations. You're requiring us two on this project. So whatever that, that delta is, you know, we're going to add it to the budget. So, and it, it, then it'll be recouped and fall into the same sort of cost center. Uh, usually what happens there is the publisher then says, no, I don't really want you to have it that bad. I don't want to pay for it. And we'll just stick with one. So that's sort of the negotiation tactic to get it to what you already had. At least in my experience. One more, anybody? Yeah. Um, is mediums a situation where Google and your laptop are starting to look similar? Have you seen any changes in terms of how you know, you know, sequels, prequels, options? Yeah. Software works. What do you see? I think the bigger question isn't necessarily the platform. I think the bigger question is, what's a sequel now, right? If, if, if your game is sort of an ongoing, living, breathing game with new content and new levels, you know, the, the new levels that, uh, you know, that King put on my, on my uh, you know, Candy Crush game, that's still Candy Crush. It's not a sequel, right? But it's new content. So, so where's that line uh, on there? You know, normally a publisher and developer are going to have some sort of agreement about, uh, who's going to do a sequel or what rights the other has in, in sort of a first or last sort of match, um, you know, about who gets to do it. Uh, that's going to depend on who owns the IP, of course. But the question is, you know, what is that sequel? And uh, or what, you know, versus a port, uh, things like that, or, or versus added content on the, on the existing game. And when, when is it different enough to trigger that? And and that's that depends on each game. Right? Uh, but normally the, the, the company that owns the IP is going to, you know, have rights that are, are going to control the sequel rights, and the other side is going to try to attach themselves in some fashion. It just sort of depends on the level of leverage. I think that's really independent of the platform. I don't know if that answers your question. Though. That's probably it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.